Cherry, you are part of the oldest family-run business in Charlevoix, still operating under the original owner. So you and Lynn started Archbark in 1974. Right. So I guess we want to tell your story of how it all came to be. Well, I first met Lynn after I graduated from high school in the Detroit area. I went to Thurston, which is in Redford Township. And uh, I met my wife um, while I was in college. I was off at Western. Um, but the very first year, after my first year of college, I went to, um, worked in a hospital there, it was uh, Mount Carmel Mercy Hospital, and I was an orderly. <clears throat> and um, you had to have connections. My, my um, uncle was the head of uh, pathology, so uh, I was also in pre-med at the time, studying to, hoping to be a doctor. But, um, when I was there, I used to take my lunch hours and go up to uh, uh, the pathology department and watch uh, autopsies. <laughs> wow, this, this <laughs> but, a very uh, strange beginning for a yeah. photographer. <laughs> so I was there for, um, I would say, a few weeks uh, working in the summer. And then one day, uh, I was at lunch with a fellow that turned out to be best man at my wedding. Uh, we we're sitting there, Gavin. I met him there. That's where I met him. And there was this girl up in the uh, line getting lunch. And my buddy says, "Hey, Terry, look at that girl up there." And I looked over and I thought, "She looks a little stuck up." I mean, you know, she was wearing a kind of a, a tweed suit, and she was had her nose. She was looking like this. And I thought, "Oh dear," you know. I thought uh, she's kind of stuck up. Well, the the next day we were in the lunch room, and we went back, and she came in again. This time she was in scrubs. And she looked a lot more humble, and she was really cute. And I uh, found out later that she had forgotten her glasses the first day, and she had, was, had her nose up because she was squinting to see the menu. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. well, but right. uh, she went through her training, and a couple days later when she finished, uh, the head of the, the uh, training division, Mrs. DeGrace, it was a, a Catholic hospital, and she was a nun, uh, she brought... Lynn up the back stairs to the floor that I worked on and said, Mr. Salmonson, I'd like you to meet Miss Rose. And I was like, wow, she was hot. <laughs> and her little pinafore, you know, the cute little the, uh, outfit they yes. wear. And uh, I thought, oh my goodness. Um, so she said, take her up and introduce her to the nurses. So I went down the hallway with her and I'm walking along thinking, what can I say to her that I want to try to make an impression? So. I said to her, gosh, is there, if there's anything I can do for you while you're here, you know, if anything, I'd like to help you with an enema. And well, she, she said, problem. that's the sweetest thing anybody said to me. She said, I was scared to death to do that. And so it was, that was the kind of way we started. And we were together that whole summer and really had a great time. We really enjoyed each other. Dated a little at the end of the summer and I went back to college. And uh, I just remembered her, and for some reason, uh, the day that I said goodbye to her, um, there was a full moon. And I said, the next time you see a full moon, you know that I'm thinking about you. And it turned out that her address was 11719 Mansfield in Detroit. And I used to live at a, at a place that had an address of 11714. So I just remembered the number and I, and I didn't get her phone number or address or anything. But while I was off at school, uh, the first full moon came around and I was sitting out on the back of my apartment and thinking, gee, that girl was really neat. And I remembered her address. So I wrote her name and I didn't have her zip code or with back then it was zone. She was a zone 39, I think, but I didn't remember. So I just put her name and her address on and I mailed her a letter that I would like to have her come up for homecoming. Well, she got the letter yeah. and uh, got in touch with me. And so she came up and that was the beginning of our more serious romance. The end of that year, I moved back down to Detroit to Wayne State University because I wanted to go to the Detroit, uh, wanted to go to their med school. Uh -huh. So I figured, well, that'd help me get in there if I did the undergraduate there. So for those two years, uh, I f finished up my pre-med. We dated and got engaged in 1974 on Valentine's Day. This and. Is so um, First and then Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a romantic. I think I, I think I gave her um, 
baby Ruths and Roses or you know, whatever. There was a song out then about that. And so I, we, we are at the top of the flame. Oh my gosh, that was another story, the day we got engaged. That was a Michigan Consolidated Gas Building. A, there, was a, there was a restaurant at the top. I don't believe there is now. It was called the Top of the Flame, and it was really exclusive. So I had the roses and the baby roots up there, and I, we went up and sat down, and I, um, as I got there at the table and we ordered our dinner, it dawned on me I had left the ring that I was going to give her in the car, which was like 25 floors down. And so I said, oh, I've got to go to the bathroom. So I jumped on the elevator and went down the stairs all the way to the bottom. And I took off and I ran about a quarter of a mile back to my car. And in the glove box, I had pulled it out and I ran back. And this, I was in track at that time, so I was in pretty good shape. I came running in the front door of the, the hotel or the building and the people were just, door was closing and they stopped the door. I jumped, ran in and I'm standing there huffing and puffing and they're looking at me like, what the heck's going on? Wow. And so I pulled out the ring and I showed them and I told them everything that was happening and they said, oh my gosh, well, we're going up to have dinner. And so they were watching us like hawks all the way through the dinner. But um, when we got uh, at the end of the dinner, I was sitting there thinking, I hadn't even thought about giving her the ring until I got finished up my steak. I think we had filet mignon. And, oh, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I gotta give her this ring. And we had all these dishes between us. So I started clearing out the table. I started piling up dishes and moving them over. So I had a clear way, uh, she, in there, you know, and I thought, how am I gonna do this? You know, I got the ring out and put it on my hand and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, oh I'm, I'm stuck. And right about that moment, the doors of the kitchen went open with a big bang and a guy came walking out with a baked Alaska with flames shooting up and she went, oh, and I thought, now's my chance. And I grabbed her hand and I put the ring on her finger and she looked down and said, oh, and then she got tears in her eyes, and, oh my gosh, you know, so. And That's how we got engaged. And, and here it was in the field of medicine. So this is really interesting <laughs> because here you are a photographer. So what next after that? Uh, well, th well, the people, they cheered <clears throat> that I had ridden in the elevator with. Mm -hmm. And they invited us over and brought us some champagne. And we talked with them for a bit. And we went home and told her parents that we were engaged. And they were tickled. The, mm -hmm. Her father uh, was a pilot from the Canadian in the Second World War, and so we had a lot in common. I, yeah. But um, at that point, um, we went, I went back to school. Yeah. I finished up. Um, I decided not to be a doctor. When we got married in September of 64, I, uh, we got married, and I dropped out of, my, out of medical school, and I thought, well, I got to go back and get a, get a degree. And I had been working in a factory. It was a stamping plant, and it was noisy and a lot of hard work and long hours, and you know, pay wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, I thought, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. So I went back and got my degree in fine arts. Now, was Lynn nursing all this time? No, Lynn was, uh, she was going to, uh, she studied to be a, a medical uh, technician. Okay, okay. And, so uh, she was doing her yeah, thing she while would, you were trying to find your way through the numbers. Yeah, well, she was paying our way at that time because I substitute taught to make a few dollars, but she had a job in a doctor's office working with them. She did, back then those girls did everything. They did x-rays and blood work and they did it all right there in the, in the office. And so she was... Uh, very uh, talented, uh, has had a lot of experience. So, but so um, get out of tool and die. Now, how did you get away from that? And then well, yeah, well, I just knew I didn't want to do that because uh -huh. it's uh, like I said, it was dirty and noisy and very monotonous. I mean, sitting in front of a press, punching your foot and thing going up and down, and there's always the chance you're going to stick your hand in there. I mean, back then the safety wasn't as like it is today, right. and the robots they have today to help, but. Anyway, I graduated in 1966 in December with my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in goldsmithing and ceramics. And three days after I, got a, got, I graduated, I got a draft notice. It was during the Vietnam conflict, and I thought, oh boy, I thought they might pass me up, because at that time, I think I was just, I just turned 25. I thought they might pass me by, because I was married, but the fact that I had a deferment for school, that didn't, that didn't matter. So I ended up um, going.
going down for my physical at Fort Wayne. And I thought, man, I don't want to be an a, a army guy in the swamp somewhere in Vietnam, you know. And so I thought, I'd rather be a pilot. So on the way back, I stopped by the Air Force recruiter's office and said, hey, you know, I got my draft notice. Can I sign up for the Air Force? And he said, absolutely. So I went, I'd signed up, and I went and took the physical and had to go in for the, uh, the test to be a pilot, you know, to see if you have the aptitude for it. Have you ever thought of that? Piloting. No, I had never <laughs> flown. I had never flown in my life except that when I was out of high school, uh, Indiana University wanted to see me. I played. Fo I was all all suburban and all state uh, honorable mention in 1961, okay. and they wanted to see if I wanted to come there to go to college and play football. Mm -hmm. And I flew in a DC a DC seven, I think it was called. It was a prop job. That's the only airplane I'd ever been in. So. I didn't go to Indiana. I decided I wanted to go to Western and run track. So okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I went in to take my test um, to be aptitude. And the guy looked at my transcript, and he saw that I was an artist, that I had ceramics and goldsmithing. And he thought, wow. He said, looked at me and says, well, good luck with the test. You know, this is pretty technical. And I thought, well, he didn't have a clue because I had a minor, a major in chemistry and a minor in physics, and I had taken math and all, all the sciences that went with being in pre-med, and I finished all that. So it was a breeze. I mean, I came back, and I ended up with in the 90s on the test, and he looked at me and said, that's pretty good for an artist. <laughs> but uh, when did, you know, back for your art a minute. So you got this degree in art. Where did that come from? Had you always wanted to be an artist? Did yeah, I was. I, when I was in high school, I really loved art. And uh, that was my, uh, I remember I was trying to decide whether I wanted to be an artist. And the idea of being starving artist didn't appeal to me as much as being a doctor. And I, I love sciences too, so I decided to go for the doctor. But ultimately, I ended up back in art. And uh, Goldsmithing, what was the other? What were, what were the two degrees you got? Well, it's one degree. It's called crafts. It was I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts, which is it takes more hours than a, to just a straight bachelor's degree. And Bachelor of Fine Arts takes another 10 or 15 hours of extra work. It's kind of between or an advanced, you know, anyway, bachelor's degree. And uh, when I, since I had so many hours, I had 120 hours in pre-med, so I went back and got another 120 to get my bachelor, so I had enough hours to have two bachelor's degrees. But pre-med didn't offer any kind of degree, it was all sciences. I had to switch colleges and go from the College of Science into the College of Liberal Arts. And uh, I had to pick up all kinds of classes and yeah. you know art history and English and things that you was were running track along. Yes, I ran school. track at Western, and then I when I went to Wayne, I ran track there too. Now somewhere along the line, you had your first child. Was well, that no, that was school? that was that was later. That was later. Okay, yeah. so let's get back to the Air Force. So now you joined the Air Force. <clears throat> right so after I got work. yeah I got we okay. took off for the Air Force and I had to go to officer training, and. Um, this is the first, the, this kind of goes into the, later in the story is I went up, um, went down to officer training and uh, I spent 12 weeks there to become an officer and Lynn came down for my graduation and uh, lo and behold, we can figure out that that was actually the weekend that she got pregnant with my first son, Tim. <laughs> because that's the first time I'd seen her in 12 weeks and it was nine months later <laughs> to right. the yeah, day. So it was obviously we enjoyed seeing each other. Obviously. But um, after I, uh, I went out, I got my uh, officer, got to be an officer, I flew back with her to, the, uh, to Detroit. Okay. Uh, and we stayed here for about a month before I went uh, into pilot training. And um, well, while we were here, my mother and dad, we were at a cottage. My mom and dad have a cottage on Elk Lake. And uh, while we were here, they took us to dinner one night to the Aragon. And we drove up from Elk Rapids and came into town just late in the day when the beautiful sunlight is floating over the bay, you know, the harbor there. It was like Lynn and I both went, wow, is this ever cool? What a neat little town. So we had dinner and then went back 
you know, and then I ended up back in Arizona and uh, finished my pilot training a year later. It takes 53 weeks. And uh, I was assigned to fly F-4s, which is the Phantom, which is the main airplane for um, being in Vietnam. That was their, probably their backbone of most of the airstrikes were F-4s. So Are you a I went. About this? Yes. Well, sure I mean, it was, was something when I knew, you know, when I got in the service. Uh, basically, you know, I knew I was going to probably end up in Vietnam because yeah. that's where everybody was going. But um, I had to go to survival school and radar training and all that stuff. That took another, almost another year for me to finish the training in the F-4. Well, while I was in pilot training, my son Tim was born. That's, he's my eldest now. He was in born Arizona. in 1968. Okay. And um, so I got out of, finished there and had my orders to go to Thailand uh, to the war, you know, to be a pilot over there. And they canceled my orders about a week before we left. And there were six of us that were just sitting around at George Air Force Base wondering what we were going to do. And then we got orders to go to Germany. There were six of us went to Germany. There were actually 12 guys. Six went to Germany and six went to Seymour Johnson um, to fl fly with the squadrons. The Seymour Johnson fellows would spend six months in Korea. Uh, on what they call Victor Alert, which is like a, um, it's a SAC mission where you're sitting in a bunker with an atomic bomb on the bottom of your airplane waiting for World War III to start. So I went to Germany and did the same thing. And uh, we had a three-year assignment there, and I got to take my wife and my new baby. And while we were there, my second son was born. At, uh, uh, so I have, he was born in 71. And... Um, we decided one day we were there sleep, you know, we were in the morning on the Saturday morning. I didn't have to fly and we were laying in bed thinking about our future. And this was about probably 1971, I'm guessing. And you had been in like three years for the Air Force and you had to do Well, I got in in 68, uh, 67 I joined mm -hmm. and it took me the two years to get to that point. Then I had another three years to go. So it must have been about 1971. And we were laying there dreaming about our future, what did we do? And at that point, I had a degree in ceramics, and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be neat if we could start a business and have a little shop? And I, we got talking, and Lynn says, how about that little town that we went through? And I said, oh, that would be so cool. And I could have my wheel in the window, and I could throw pots there, and people would see it and come in and buy our pots. Well, it turned out to be pretty prophetic because ultimately I, we ended up here not as a potter. Um, while I was in Germany, I bought a couple of good cameras and my son Tim, when he was born, I bought a camera to take pictures of him and I got involved in the dark room. I spent all kinds of time in the dark room. I just loved it. I mean, it was really a lot of fun for me. And they had good facilities in the service. They had dark rooms and I developed all my own film and we did everything. And so. I developed, you know, my craft to a certain degree, and uh, I had it when I was in Germany. We lived off the base in a beautiful two-story old house that um, was in downtown Bitburg, which is where I was stationed. That's over not too far from Luxembourg. That kind of brings me to another story. I'll make this one quick. While my father was during the Second World War, he was in the Battle of the Bulge and with Patton. He was in the infantry that was in advance of Patton as they moved across Germany toward the Rhine. Well, one night they were just came from Luxembourg. They were shelling. Patton was shelling this town all night. In the morning, he woke up and out of his foxhole, he could see the whole town was level except for two buildings. The town hall, which is kind of a historic building, and this house that sat over on the left side, kind of on the south side of town. And he went on to, you know, f finish the war. And at the Rhine, they met the Germans eventually, or the, um, they met the Germans, yeah, they met the uh, Russians. And yes. anyway, while I was stationed there in Germany, my father came to visit, with my mother and father came, and when we drove across the countryside from um, Frankfurt 
after they had landed there, we drove across the countryside and we get, kind of backtracked on the very trail that he had been during the war. We went through towns, I remember Vitlich was one of them, and he was telling, doing a running commentary about how the Germans were up on the hill and they had a tank destroyer there and we were down by the river and trapped there for a day and we stayed in a castle and I mean, he was going on. It was just so incredible to have him telling us all this stuff that had happened to him while he was in Germany. And there you were in that very area. Well, when we got to Bitburg, we came in the back way and we drove around the corner and we came up to this house and my dad said, I don't believe it. This is the house that was standing when I was here. The whole town was flat, except for that house. And it had some damage, and it was a beautiful house. It has, had stained glass windows, and it was uh, really beautiful. But wow, I had my dark story. room in the basement of that house, and that, that's where I learned to, you know, I made big pictures, three feet by seven feet. I bought big pieces of plywood, and I would do them in the basement. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I say, I bought a big, a nice camera. Did and, the Air uh, Force ever ask you to do some photography for them? No, no, asking. not the Air Force. No, they didn't do that. But I did do a lot of scenic photography um, while I was there. I went, we would go hiking and go, you know, various places. And I had lots of pictures of the cathedrals and the countryside. And I'd make big prints and put them on my walls in our in our house there. And uh, my squatter members would come over and they'd see the pictures and rave about them and I'd so I'd give them to them. <laughs> so I gave away most of the photography. That's an original yeah. Terry Solomonson. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, I really got to loving it and I got thinking, gee, this would be awesome if I could do this for a living. So I thought, you know, when I get out of the service, I'll have the GI Bill. I'll go back and get a master's degree in photography. So I contacted the University of Michigan and Wayne State. And I went to University of Michigan, I got a letter back, said our class is full this year, you could apply next year, the master's program is filled. And I got a letter back from Wayne State, and I had sent a box of pictures with the, the application to Wayne that as kind of a portfolio. And it, I didn't have a regular portfolio, all the pictures I had were glued to a piece of particle board that was about a half an inch thick. So the box weighed about 60 pounds, I think, and we you know, shipped it over to them. And the teacher wrote me back and said, well, we don't have a master's program, but when you get back to the city, come and see me and pick up your pictures and we'll talk. So I did, and when we got back in June of 72, I went down to Wayne and saw Mr. Wilson. He was the head of the photography department. And I, said, we got talking and he looked at my pictures and said, you know, I really like, you know, what you do, I, you know, and he said, we don't have a, a, a master's program here in photography. He said, but we've been thinking about having one. He said, would you like to help me write the curriculum? And I said, oh you got to be kidding. He said, no. He said, you know, I think this is what timing is right. So I ended up having to pick up some photography classes, and I finished my master's uh, between September and June. I carried a full load. I taught school all day. I was a, a permanently placed sub in the Detroit School District. I went to the same school where they had such absenteeism from the teachers, there was always a place mm. to teach. So mm. I spent that year and I'd teach until three o'clock and most of my classes started around three or 3.30 and I told the teachers, I'm gonna be a little late, but I'll get here as soon as I can. And going into the city from out, um, out of Livernois and uh, Grand River area, that's where the school was. Mm -hmm. You go right down the freeway, it wasn't too hard to get downtown. So. I took night classes I, four days a week, five days a week, four days a week, I think. And I carried 16 hours in graduate school. And like I said, I finished up my master's in June of 72 and uh, 73. And it was because I got back in 72. And we packed so up. you're a pilot, you have a degree from the University of Art and Crafts, and now you have a degree in <laughs> photography. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, you know, I, while I was there, I taught school, and I, you know, for, for to make a few bucks, I 
her brother was a painter, and so I was a house painter with him the first few months that I was back from the service. Mm -hmm. I would go and help him, and he'd, he'd pay me for, for his help. So mm -hmm. anyway, we, um, we packed everything up. We had a, somebody had given me a boat. It was a old, oh my gosh, it was a big boat. It was like 20 feet, and it was on a trailer, and it was needed a ton of work. I don't even know if the engine worked. We put all our worldly goods in that boat and put it behind my little Camaro and pulled it up to me, up here, up to Charlevoix. And um, when we got to town, I, um, we lived in Bells Bay, which was Fisherman's Island. We had a little tent, just a small little tent for the four of us. And uh, that's where we lived and we were looking for a house and a job. And while I was here, I stopped in the Chamber of Commerce and I said, walked in and lo and behold, Tom Murda was there. I went to high school with Tom Murda. He graduated in 60 and I graduated in 61. And he was so surprised to see me. He says, you know, Bob Miles just retired. We really need a photographer here in town. And I said, oh, that's awesome, you know. So mm -hmm. we looked for a house and a place to live and we were, had a terrible time. We only had like 3,000 bucks in the bank and no job. So I can't understand why they wouldn't let us buy a house. <laughs> As smart as I, you know, I'm thinking, geez, you know, I, I think, look back on that and think, how crazy were we? You know, we're thinking we're going to buy a house big enough to put a studio in. That's what our hope was. So I got a job uh, because of John Georgie was so kind. Uh, we were there looking at houses and had salespeople were trying to find something for us. and They couldn't do it. And he sat down with us and said, look, you're not qualified to buy a house. Do you have a place to live? I said, well, we're living in Bells Bay at the moment. Yeah. And he said, well, I have a farmhouse out on Randy Road uh, near East Jordan. He said, are you handy? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm, my dad taught me how to take care of things. And so he said, well, if you'll live there and work on it, I got some things I need you to do. Put in some cupboards and this. And I said, fabulous. So we, that's where we lived for the first summer that I was there. And he also told me about Ski and Shore, which is, that was the name of the business that he was involved with. They just opened an office in Petoskey and Don Snizik was the broker and he said, you go up and talk to him, he might give you a job. So I went up and saw Don and sure enough, he said, no problem. You go ahead and get your, your license, your real estate license. And so I spent a few weeks studying for my real estate license and studying all the listings. And that was back in the early 70s when things were selling like hotcakes up here. So it was a great time to get into the real estate business. And uh, in 1973, um, I spent the whole summer there in the winter uh, working with him. And uh, I've got a lot of my photographs. I still have photographs that I took early in the morning when I'd be driving up and there'd be a snow, a snow storm or an ice storm and I'd stop and take pictures along the way. And I have some of those photographs in my repertoire of, of uh, things today that I still, people see the yeah. old pictures. But um, I worked there, I did, I was very successful and in 1973 in December we had enough to make a down payment on a house so we bought a little yeah. house over here just a block away from the library it's on Antrim Street right through mm -hmm. the other side and uh, we've lived there ever since and remodeled and added on some things a porch and a sure. couple of bedrooms and bathroom and, and now it's your own, not yeah rental, yeah so um, so yeah, that was. The shop. How did you start the well, shop? that was interesting because <clears throat> once we had the house, I was trying to figure out how we could have a studio there. You know, we we're trying to keep our expenses down, and there was like a shed on the back of the house, and they said, "Well, maybe we can make a studio there." Well, the shed only was about four and a half feet at one side and about eight feet on the other. It really wasn't suitable, and Lynn said. Wise gal. She said, you know, if you're going to go into business, you're going to have to be downtown where people can see you. So we went downtown, talked to Tom Murda, and he said, go across the street to the Market Mall. They just renovated that, that whole facade that was all finished, but the inside of the building was Brown Motors, which was the same family that owns Brown Motors in Petoskey. Mm -hmm. And Brown Motors was there, and when you went through the front doors into what would be the 
main uh, galley of the mall when you walked in was the dirt floor. And then you went down and there it was all still the old auto dealer that was there, the, you know, where they fix cars. And so um, I got this little shop, it was right next to Gary Balsh's barber shop. Now he was renting in there first. He had a little shop on the far end and uh, we were next to him. And so I spent the summer remodeling and getting ready to open my studio downtown. And uh, while we were doing that, uh, we had been down to visit her mom and dad. And uh, we were telling them excited about we're gonna have a new business and I'm gonna call it creative photography so I can be the first in the phone book. And my father-in-law, a very studious guy with his pipe and his paper and he never looked up. He said, if you wanna be first in the phone book, call yourself Aardvark. And I said, oh, that's a neat idea. It's got two, it's got an A. And two he A's. says, no, he said it has two A's. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh, that's right. That's, even that's better, yeah. So we, uh, I, thought it, I thought I'd change it from Aardvark to Artvark, A-A-R-T. Right. Yeah, okay, so that's what we did. And, uh, and we spent the whole summer getting ready. And this is the funniest thing. When you think about it, you're a new business, trying to open a new business, you're trying to do well. So when did I open up? The day after Thanksgiving in 1974. And the prime time. Yeah, prime time. Oh my gosh. It's just amazed, amazing that we could survive for the, for the winter. I know we were paying $190 a month rent for the, for the place that we were in. And an interesting side note was on Thanksgiving Day, the day before we opened, there had been a big snor storm on Wednesday night into Thursday, and there were like there was 10 or 12 inches of snow on the ground. It was a very freak thing, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a track in town in the morning. When I woke up, we went out, and the whole town was paralyzed because they didn't have all the plows ready. And I walked down, I had my camera, nice camera. I bought a camera in Germany, a Hasselblad, which is really a nice camera. And I walked down, right down the middle of Antrim Street, all the way to Bridge, and there wasn't a track anywhere, even on Bridge Street. There hadn't been any cars, and I was thinking, what can I take a picture of? It was just, everything was covered with snow. And I remembered that there was a sailboat sitting in the harbor. And it, I went over the hill and I looked and there it was. It was the Windigo, which is a 72 foot yawl. Had a 125 foot mast and an, had a mizzen in the back. It was a beautiful boat. It was in terrible shape. And the interesting thing about it, later I found out, I took that picture and the, just to make a long story short, it, and it has, I still sell that picture. It's so peaceful and calm and here's this beautiful sailboat sitting all covered with snow and the harbor behind. And you can see Ballingers and, and Walker Marine, some of the things that are gone now were all in the background. It was a very peaceful, peaceful picture that we found out later that five guys that were in their 20s had just got out of school and they borrowed 10,000 bucks a piece to buy that boat for $50,000. It was built in the 30s in Holland. It's a wooden boat and it was the largest sailing vessel on the Great Lakes at the time, sport sailing vessel. Not a, you know, I don't think there were any big sailboats then. It was past that, they were all steamed by then. But it was so big, and it raced in the Chicago to Mackinac, from what I understand, seven times and won every time it raced, because they didn't have a handicapping system that would account for that size of that boat. He could handle waves and wind that others couldn't. So that boat turned out to be very famous. And most of the guys that were owners have come into my shop and bought that picture because it was sitting there in the harbor the day that uh, the Thanksgiving day, and we opened our next the next day, and um, it was uh, it was amazing. We made it, you know, through the winter, and next summer we were doing fine. So how did you start out getting business? Was it just word of mouth? Or was well, put pictures in the window. Mostly it was scenic photography, okay. and uh, I also another thing that got us up here and that made helped us to be able to be a photographer here was <clears throat> I had. Got, come up and talk to Sheila Brady 
Um, she was the president, I think, of the 1974 senior class, or 73, let me think. What was it? I did the pictures in the summer. Yeah, it must have been 74. No, it was 73. I came up there in the 72 and visited and talked to her, and she said they wanted me to have the contract to do all the seniors. So I did all the senior pictures for the Charlevoix High School in 1973 for the seniors of 73. That's a great way to get your face out there. Well, it got me, yeah, it got me started, and it was, uh, we didn't make, you know, I mean, back then, senior pictures weren't what they are today as far as the pricing goes, but right. that was one of the things we did in photography to get started. So mostly landscape things that get you through the winter and the, the pictures for the yearbook. Yeah, that was it, and that was. You were glad to see spring break, I'm sure. Yeah. So, how did the business take off from there? Well, mainly, mainly it was the summertime. You know, the families, people would come up, and back then, you know, those were pretty good years. Carter, uh, Nixon, and eventually Reagan. You know, those were. It's a good time to be in business. By the time we got up to the end of the '90s. Uh -huh. um, the economy was really booming and things were really doing well and it was all you know, part of God's plan I guess that we would survive and uh, we just kind of rolled with the flow and got new equipment and uh, when I first did p photography I was I didn't really know what I was doing. I had a master's degree from in photography but it was from a university, it was a master of arts and I didn't teach me anything about business or how to do portraits or how to do any of that stuff. And I was just kind of winging it. Well, I, I went to a, a study at Sandy Creek. It was like a, an event uh, in the wintertime. And there were, it was Michigan, Professional Photographers of Michigan. And I went in there and I was, wanted to go in and take some classes and find out what a professional thing was all about. Well, I, I went in at lunchtime and I sat down with one of the, a couple of the photographers and I got talking to them. There was a fellow there who was from Bay City. I wish I could remember his name. He's gone now, but I said, boy, I would really like to find out. And he says, I'll tell you what, just tell them you're an associate of mine and that you can get into the classes. And so I went back and gave him his name and they, no problem, I got registered and I went in. And I found out what it was all about. You know, I mean, I got I got excited about being a professional photographer and really being involved in rubbing shoulders with professionals. So the next year, I joined the Professional Photographers of Michigan, and I went to their convention and I entered their print competition, where you I you know, did talking to the guys and you'd give 16 by 20 prints, and they'd bring them up and they'd score them. Well, I had four prints that I could enter, and three of the prints got red ribbons, which is good score. That would be between 70 and 80, okay. or 70 and 79. If you got an 80, you got a blue ribbon. Okay. So I had three of them got in the show, and the fourth one didn't make it. And I, I had a, a, a whole, my whole score was like 200 and, 70 or 250 or something like that, I can't remember. But the guy who was one of the top 10 photographers in Michigan had a score of like 290. And I realized if I had hung that last print that I could have been in the top 10. Well then I really got excited about it. And at that convention, they had the, the professional photographers of Detroit had a competition, they said, Anybody who's like to make a little thing and say why they would like to go and get trained as a professional at Winona, which was the school for the professional photographers of America. Mm -hmm. And it's in Winona, it was in northern uh, Indiana. Okay. And I, so I filled this thing out while well, I won. And I was so excited, so I went the next year and I went down and then I really found out how to take pictures and how to do portraits and how to light and how to pose people. And I mean, it was, I just gobbled it up and I really enjoyed it. Well, my and photographer- was Lynn helping you through all this? Did oh she, yeah, she, like, gosh, that first year when we did the seniors, uh -huh. we did all our photography at the school. Okay. I took a background uh -huh. and I would develop the pictures myself we had what's called a unit, a unidrum, I think, mm -hmm. 
It was a 16, a, a 20 inch or a 16 inch tube. And I would go in the dark room and I'd expose the paper and I'd put it in and I'd give it to Lynn. And we had a, a big vat of water that kept the temperatures about right. And then she would pour the chemicals in one at a time at the right timing. She had to do this all. We did it all by hand. So that's the way we printed for that first year that we were in business in, in a kitchen sink. Oh we were making these prints. And uh, so that was, that was the way we, we did that. But now, when did Beacon Center get built? In or has this been re more recently? Because it was Market Mall for some years. Yeah, in 1990 they started. Uh, okay, was, so this was uh, later then. I was renting from a group of guys. That, uh, some of them were, there was a fellow that owns the clo clothes, uh, the, uh, clothes post. His name was John. Jorgensen? Yes, that was it. He was one of the owners, and he was kind of my contact. And that's where we were renting from for 190 and. They kept raising our rent little by little by little, and they got more people in there. Linda Mason was in there, and Jim Maybe, and the clothing company, and several other businesses came into the mall over the year, over the years that we were there. And Jorgensen was involved, mm -hmm. but they eventually sold it to Mike Bernard, and Mike Bernard was my landlord, and that was about, must have been in the late 80s, 88, uh, 89 maybe. He bought the building, and when we go, to, we would go to Florida in the winter time. <clears throat> we bought our place. Let me think. Uh, yeah, what? That must have been 1990. Oh, that was yeah, that was when it was, and my that was our first winter in Florida because my son David had graduated from high school in '89, and he ended up um, going off to college, and we had an empty nest, so we spent the winter down in Florida driving around looking for some place mm -hmm. to live. And while we were there, I got a call from Mike and he said, I am gonna sell this, the bill, we're gonna condominiumize the building and you're the only one in here who, you know, all these people had an opportunity. You could buy before I list it and save the listing, the commission, if you'd like. And it was 165,000 and the shop that I was in originally was 13 feet wide and 50 feet deep. It was just the little shop, the same size as, well now as the sunglass shop. But my unit would include the sunglass shop, which was Gary Balsh's at that time, and my business. So that would make me, what, uh, 26 feet wide. And it went back 100 feet, all the way back to the hallway in the back. And so all those little shops all became a part of my unit. So, so I, that, we decided, this is it. We're going to do this. And yeah. so we bought, our, we bought the condo. We were the first ones in it. I'm talking about your awards a little bit. Because oh. I know that you won first, I guess it was first prize in that one that you just told me about. Or not for, you got your ribbons, your red ribbons. Was that the first time you had gotten awards for your photography? That was the first time that I got involved in competition. Okay, so and, now how do you get all these well, other awards that we know? What had happened was later um, I was in competition and the following year I entered competition again and now I knew more about how to, how to compete mm -hmm. and I won, I was in the top 10 in Michigan. And I did that for six years in a row. I was one of the top 10 photographers in Michigan. I moved up a little closer to the number one. I never did become the, the number one guy, but I um, was doing well enough to get you know, awards like that. And there was a fellow by the name of Dave Singer. He was a representative from North American Photo at that time. And he was saying, Terry, did you ever enter in the national? And I said, oh man, I said, you know, the national, I can see how hard it is to be here in Michigan. I can't imagine what the competition would be in the national. And he said, Terry, Michigan is one of the best states in the country for photography. And he said, you would do fine. And I thought, oh my gosh. So I, bought, I joined the Professional Photographers of America and I started, I sent four of my pictures off to enter in the competition, hoping I would get a blue ribbon. In order to get a master's degree from the Professional Photographers of America, you have to have 13 points that are gotten by prints and 
12 points that are gotten by teaching classes. You could do them all with prints, but most people would teach classes and you get a couple of points for teaching a class. Well, you get one point for every blue ribbon, and if they accepted your work into the permanent collection, the loan collection, you got two points. Well, when I got my, uh, I got my uh, award, my, my letter back from Professional Photographers of Michigan, I had two blue ribbons and two in the loan. Oh my God. So I made six points in the first year that I ever competed. So and, now you uh, knew. Yeah. Two years later, I had all the points I needed to be a master photographer and the professional photographers of America. So what about that Kodak kid? That was <clears throat> one of the photographs that I um, that I entered in. It was in they had the it was in Traverse City. It was at the Professional Photographers of Michigan, mm -hmm. and it's a it's called uh, Misty Harbor, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a picture of the harbor in the fog. And the way we printed it, we printed it very light and we kind of dodged out the edges so it made it look very dreamy, but the boats, it's all still and all the reflections in the water. I entered that in the competition and it went up, when it came up on the board, all the judges looked at it, they all got up and they walked up to the thing and they were looking at it and looking at it and they went back and sat down and they said it gave, they gave me a 94, which was a blue ribbon. Well, the picture went back, and then one of the photographers said, I want to bring that picture back. He said, you guys tell me what's wrong with that picture. Why is it a 94? And so they brought the picture back, and they got up, and they looked at it again, and they said, man, it looks like a painting. It looks like artwork, but I can't see any. And there was no artwork on it. It was just simply the painting. And three of the five judges gave me a hundred. No kidding. And the other two gave me a ninety-nine. And the fact that it, that added up to be, ended up with a ninety-nine point four, and I couldn't get a hundred. I would have been, and that was the highest score that any score in Michigan had ever gotten. No one had ever gotten a ninety-nine on a print. Uh, uh, before that. And, and you said that one went to Epcot, didn't you? Yeah, That's well, well that was, you know, it, um, it did a little different when it was involved with Kodak. Mm -hmm. After I, they put that, I won Best of Show in Michigan, which I did, I did that three times when you enter your competition. If you have the best photograph of all the photographers in your, in your category, you would get Best to Show. And I did that three times. And that was one of the photographs that was best to show. And then Kodak, there was a representative there, and he looked at the picture and said, I won uh, the, what's called the gallery award. So they do give one gallery award to every state in the country when they do their convention. And the gallery award then lets you, you they compete. They take 20 of the 50 pictures and they pick the 20 that they want to put in their traveling show. And so Kodak would go from states and they would, you know, every time they have an exhibition where they set up their booth, mine was one of the 20. Wow. So, right. and so that was, in the that was a, gallery? a okay. professional photographers. Right. And um, where's that? Where's the National Gallery? Oh, that's in Chicago. In Chicago. Um, the uh, other, one of the other best of shows they had was a family portrait. I had done the year before. I had uh, the year before I did this portrait. It's a picture of a, one of the photographers and his wife and, and daughter. And the year before, I had entered a photograph that ended up with a blue ribbon, and it was a picture of a couple kissing in the woods in on the path there in the pine trees at the top of the hill, right by the end of Antrim and Mason uh, or Clinton, where that comes out there. And so. Um, I won an award there, and one of the photographers said, Terry, I want you to do my family portrait there. I just love that picture. And so the next year, I was teaching a class working for my master's degree, and had all the photographers from the Michigan had come with me, and we were outside there on the hill, and I was showing them how I do my family portraits. And I posed the, the, the people down the, on the path, and I set up and I took their photograph. Well, it turns out in the following year, 
I entered it in a competition, and it was best to show, and it was accepted by Kodak to hang at the Epcot Center. So it was uh, a real honor to have, uh, have a, one of my photographs. Uh, I guess. Uh, and you're also, every year, in the waterfront, Charlevoix Waterfront Art Fair. Yeah. Which, you know, is We've been in there, my gosh, I think the first time I entered was, it must have been, I would say probably 77, 70, 78, I don't know. I haven't been in the, the, the whole time, but it was way back in the early years of the art fair, and we've been in every year yeah, since. And every year. What, what do you see as the, the change in photography from when you, you first started, you know, and developing in your dark room and yeah. now everything's sort of digital, right? Is that yeah, the that's true. That it switched over in the early, around 2000, mm -hmm. and we started to get considering the, the, the uh, digital photography. I remember my son and I, Tim, went down to Chicago and went to a Kodak class or they, they were talking about the digital camera mm -hmm. and they had this professional digital camera it cost eighteen thousand dollars and it had a file it would had a chip in it and the file was 1.8 megabytes and that was a professional camera and it it took really beautiful pictures and you couldn't blow them up real big but it was like, wow, and I thought 18,000 is out of my class, out of my league for that. It wasn't long later, and then the price of cameras, they started coming out. Kodak invented the chip. They invented the CCD. That's the strangest thing, that they stuck with film after they had been, the, they were the top of the pile with film, and they thought they're gonna carry that into the next, and they, just fell on their face. And the odd thing is, they were the ones that were responsible for digital photography. They have invented the very first CCD. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Yeah, well then the Japanese said, okay, we'll use that. So they took off with it. And yeah. How did you feel about that? Because it seems to me that the artist in you kind of like that whole thing about developing. I mean, do you feel the same about, you know, photoshopping, which you're an expert at? Well, a lot of the photography that I entered in competition um, and this is something I manipulated in the darkroom. I mean, if you know anything about darkroom work, if you're a photographer and ever worked in the darkroom, you know that you can dodge, you can kind of hold back the light from certain areas to keep the shadows from getting too dark. And the highlights, you can take a piece of cardboard with a hole in it and burn in. So dodging and burning was real big. And I was quite good at it, and I did all my own printing. And I would take two negatives and sandwich them together. I was always looking for an image that had an edge, something that was different. And some of those won awards in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Well, digital photography gives you that to the nth degree. All the limitations that I had in the darkroom are gone. Now, whatever I can imagine, I can make it happen. And I absolutely love that as an artist that I have the ability, just like a painter, to manipulate the scene in any way. You know, there are some photographers are purists and they think it's on, that's not a good thing to be able to bring in a new sky or take out, erase the telephone pole or these things that we can do now. Right. And I, you know, I, I say, I give them, you know, that's awesome that they, they feel like they want to just be a purist but I say, as an artist, the photographer has now, he has all the tools that he needs to be just like a watercolorist or an oil painter. You can create images like, you know, with no problem at all. You have a boy, Tim, I think, who's into, isn't he into the business and somewhat producing? No, he was with me for a while, but he got, he, he was, uh, he's in ministry and he really liked missions, and so he spent a lot of years, he left my, being my business partner, or, you know, in my business, and went off to mission field. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's still real involved in that, although he does come up for the summertime. He's living in Chicago. Do you see him ever maybe following your footsteps, or not? I kind of doubt it, but you never know. You know, I mean, he loves it, too, and it's mm -hmm. possible that, uh, you know, he might take over, but I don't know about that. Right. Uh, but going forward, you're still vital and you're part of the 
the whole art scene yeah, and the photography it's, scene. And, it's really amazing when we figured out that we were the, this is our 42nd year, 42nd year. and amazed that we, there was nobody else in town that was the same, right. the same people. There are some in the family like Central Drugs and Townhouse and various businesses, but they've all been passed down to the kids or new people own. But we're so the same, same mom and pop and yeah. I think that's been the secret of our business is that we are a mom and pop and we care about people. And let's, let's end with, on your web page, you had a statement which I really loved and it was about how you feel about um, business and it's kind of like a mission statement, right? Let me see if I kind of can call that back for you. The philosophy of business on your web page. Loving what you do. Do you remember? Shall I read it? Sure, that would be Loving a... what you do, making the most out of what you have, and caring about the people you meet day to day. Yep. Important in your business because your clientele carries you. Yeah, many yeah, we've had most of our business, 60% of our business and our families is return business, right. people that come back year after year. Right. I did Judith's family uh, some, some years ago. And, and my uh, family is hanging yeah. in my family room too. And my uh, wedding. And your wedding. Yes, wedding right, well, right. This is very personal. And yeah. it's just, just a real quick story on her way back from her wedding, which took all day, and it was the middle of July, I believe, right? No, yeah, September, actually. Was, this, was it September? Yeah. Uh, it was thunderstorms all day, off and on, sunshine, thunderstorms. And on the way back, there, there were, reception was up in Harbor Springs. And I remember driving back down, and there was this thunderstorm out in the lake, and I, I was exhausted. I'd been at it since like 10 o'clock in the morning. I'd been, you know, I'd be like 12 hours or more. I was driving back and I looked out and I thought, oh my gosh, I've never taken a picture of lightning. I wonder if I can. So I went out there on the beach and set up my camera and I took about three pictures. And the way I took them, people say, well, how did you get the lightning? You must have a fast finger. I say, no, it was an eight minute exposure. <laughs> it was shooting in the dark and I set the camera up and I opened the shutter and I waited until the lightning flashed a few times and then I go on to the next picture. Now, is this the picture that Judith was saying? Judith has, has one. One. And there was two shots. I did one wide angle shot, which is in the permanent loan collection of the Professional Photographers of America. And another one that was a close up shot of the lighthouse with four lightning bolts right beside out in the lake, you know, but that's the one that she has. Well, a lot of people have your treasures hanging yeah. in their homes. I'm one of them. <laughs> Judith is one of them. And yeah. anymore. Terry, thank you so much. That oh, was it's really fun to, to get it all on DVD for you. Alrighty, thank you so much.